Good morning, everyone. Today we'll be reading 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. Kings chapter 20. And the Bible reads, And Benadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria, and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Benadad, also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, all that I have. And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Benadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thy house and the house of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, and for my children, and for my silver, and for my gold. And I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Benadad, Tell my lord the king all that thou didst send for to thy servant, at the first I will do. But this thing I may not do. And, the and Benadad sent unto him, and said, The gods do so unto me. And more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And the king of Israel and, and the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself, as he that putteth it off. And it came to pass, when Benadad heard this message, as he was drinking, he and the kings in the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array, and they set themselves in array against the city. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it in the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Even by the young men of the princes of the province, are ordered the battle. And he answered, Thou. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were two hundred and thirty-two. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being seven thousand. And they went out at noon. But Benadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the thirty and two kings that helped him. And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Benadad set out. And they, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria, take them alive, but whether they be come out for war, take them alive. So the young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city, and the army which followed them, and they slew every one his man, and the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued them, and Benadad the king of Syria escaped on a horse with the horsemen. And the king of Israel went out, and smote, horse, smote the horses and chariots, and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came to the king of Israel, and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against thee. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And number thee an army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice, and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year, that Benadad numbered the Syrians, and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered, and were all present, and went like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God, and spake unto the king of Israel, and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, and deliver all this great multitude in thy hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days, battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek, into the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Benadad fled, and came into the city, into an inner chamber. And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on your loins, and ropes upon your heads, 
from go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure, he will save thy life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Benadad safe, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he, is he yet alive? He is my brother. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him, and did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother Benadad. Then he said, Go ye bring him. Then Benadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come, come up into the chariot. And Benadad said unto him, I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made it in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him, and sent him away. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And smiting, he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside, and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. Here and there he was gone, and the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hast decided it. And he hasted, hasted and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for this church. Lord, I thank you for your, for your word, God. And uh, Lord, please fill Brother Joe with your Holy Spirit as he preaches his message and uh thank you lord uh, in jesus name amen. Amen. amen well it's good to be back and uh see everybody again i like the, the snow outside it's nice as long as we don't have to drive uh the title of my sermon this morning is hard learned lessons from a couple of losers hard learned lessons from a couple of losers and i'm not saying that to insult ahab and ben Haddad. But you know what? They really did lose a lot in life. They lost out on so many different things. We're going to learn from that. Um, you don't have to turn there, but Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our, admin or for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, this chapter, there's a lot of information in the Bible, period. But you know what? We can learn stuff even from other people's failures, from other people's mistakes. And so that's what I'm going to be preaching about uh, this morning. And like it says, it says that, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So you might be here this morning and thinking, man, life's just not going good for me right now. You know, I've made some mistakes. I've done some wrong things. I'm going to show you how you can learn to not repeat those, how to get past that in your life. And the Bible says that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, that means you do have to have that patience of, you know, hearing God's word preached over and over again, uh, reading, meditating on the scriptures and things like that. And so... Just to start out, uh, you, you know, we just read 1 Kings chapter 20. It talks about Ahab. Ahab was one of the, probably the wickedest kings that uh, Israel had. He was married to Jezebel. And uh, Jezebel's father was a king of the Zidonians. His name was Ethbaal, or however you say it, Ethbaal. But, uh, yeah, two very extremely wicked people. And uh, just for an introduction, I just want to start going through this chapter here. Uh, you keep something in 1 Kings chapter 20 because we are going to stay there for a lot of the, the, uh, the sermon. Uh, we will go to Mark real quick and maybe a couple other places, but uh, definitely be able to get back to 1 Kings 20. So look down there at verse number 1. It says, And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also... And thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. So ben just got done steamrolling. No one's been able to stop me thus far. I'm just going to go ahead and take what Israel has. And then, you know, look down here at verse 4. It says, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. Now, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm 
wants to take my stuff, that's fine. But if you want to take my family, you can forget about it. You know, and that's the attitude. We should never get this low in life to where we're just okay with the world taking from us, you know, our family or, you know, or, 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 or even our belongings. You know, we should be able to stand up to this, this kind of garbage. But you know what? Leading a life of, of you know, just, just selfishness and rejecting God's word will eventually lead you on a path to where you just feel powerless. So look at verse 5. It says, And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh ben saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver, and thy gold, and thy wives, and thy children. Look at this. He says, Yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house, and thy houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. So... Right off the bat, we can see here that if you give in to the world, right? ben Haddad is a picture of the world, a picture of the devil. If you give in to them one inch, they're just going to keep coming and keep trying to take more and more and more and more. Because you won't stop them. That's, that's, what, that's what's being taught here. But, uh, you know, so ben Haddad's like, hey, you know, I'm going to search thine house. So he's, he's like, I'm going to come violate your Fourth Amendment rights. You know, I'm going to, you know, illegal search and seizure, I, I don't really care. <laughs> but, uh, no, obviously, he didn't have Fourth Amendment rights back then, but... Uh, you know, that, that does kind of remind me that, you know, we shouldn't, as, as uh, American citizens, value the Constitution more than the Bible. Because the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If you lose God's Word in a community and you lose that Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, you're going to lose both. We're going to lose the freedoms that we have in this country as well as, you know, the freedom to preach God's Word to, to our community. So look at verse 7. It says, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he said unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. Bad deal. Verse 8, And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. So the people have more common sense than they have. They're like, look, what? don't listen to him. You know, this is foolishness. Verse 9, O oh, my lord the king, all that thou didst send for thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. And ben sent unto him and said, Thy gods do so unto me, and more also if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And the king of Israel answered, so this is where, you know, Ahab said, you know, I guess he takes his vitamins or he maybe he goes on roids or something. I don't know. But he kind of mans up here and he says, And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. So right here, you know, he's like, I'm not just going to, you know, you can have my kids, you can have my wife, you can have my wealth. But if you want to just take anything you want, you know, I, I can't deal with that. That's a, a very sad state of mind to be. So point number one, point number one here is refuse to be a pushover when the world attacks. Refuse to be a pushover when the world attacks. And that's what we see. Ahab is allowing himself to become a pushover. You know, until ben Haddad's like, okay, I'm just going to take your whole life. I'm just going to take everything from you. And then he finally decides to man up. And why? Because he doesn't have very many people. The Syrians outnumber Israel at this time, you know, by, by, by many, many, many people. And so obviously, refuse to be a pushover when the world attacks. This just happened to me. In my own life, about, what, two weeks ago, I got a, a task at work to go install a dishwasher for somebody. And I look at the, the name tag, and it says <laughs> Vera and Vivian. Okay, so most, most jobs I get will say Dave Smith, uh, Jim Jones, you know, some, you know some, some name on it, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, that's weird. And so I'm thinking, all right, and there's two sodomites, probably. <laughs> you know, and, and as, as uh, you know, the world would have it. Uh, the, the, this big district manager guy, you know, he's like, hey, I, I want to meet up with you and I want to ride with you to, to do this job. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. You know, and I still don't know for sure. It's downtown Sacramento. So I get there and sure enough, it looks like it's just two two guys. I'm like, so I knock on the door and they're like, yeah, I'm like, I'm looking like, oh yeah, that's us. I'm like, what? <laughs> what in the world's going on here? I'm like, all right, so I'm already uncomfortable. I'm starting to get pissed and I can't leave, you know, because I don't own my own business right now, you know, just getting ready to move here, but... <laughs> You know, and, and, and the boss, he comes in, and he's like, hey, guys. You know, and there's this gigantic, literally, as big as this wall. Uh, man, all right, well, you know, whatever. I got I to do this job. So, you know, I start working on it. There's a problem. I have, you know, they get him on the phone, and he's like, yeah, the girl said that there was a problem. I was like, there's no girls here. And he's like, he's like well, anyways, so we talked through this issue. He's like, can you put her back on the phone? I'm like, who's her? And the guy's like, oh, that's me. I'm like, What? <laughs> all right what, what, whatever I, I see what's going on here you know and, and, and they're man 
you know, so I go outside, I get this stupid thing ready, I come in, I put it in as fast as I possibly can, you know, and I'm like, I just want to get out of here. So we leave, we get all outside, and he's like, man, yeah, you did it, you did a good job. Um, I just, one recommendation for you, though, he's like, I could tell that they were uncomfortable with you calling them by the, the male pronouns. You kept saying, dude, man, sir, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. He's like, they clearly didn't want that, and I said, well, you know what, I just can't do that. You know, I can't give in to that. We as Christians can't give in to the world, you know, because what is my morality by making me agree with their lie? That is not something that Christians should subscribe to at all. That is satanic. And I told the dude, I can't do that. They are clearly men, and I will call them men. I have that God-given right. And he's like, I'm doing it too. He's like, but, but you're a liability. You're a liability, you know? You, he's like, you and all the old guys, man, they, they, you guys get complaints all the time. He's like, I know they're going to fill out the survey, and it's going to be a bad survey for you. You know, then let them fill it out, and you can go to hell, and I'll just get a different job. Because I would rather be poor and live in a tent than to call somebody that is a male, a female, just because you want me to. I won't do it. I refuse to do it. I'm not going to be an Ahab, and neither should anybody in this room. Amen. So, point number one, refuse to be a pushover when the world attacks, and they will attack. They will come at you. As soon as you leave this church today, I guarantee you next week something is going to happen that makes you, that, that puts you in a position to where you're going to have to compromise or where that temptation is going to be there. And I'd just like to submit to you, don't do it. Don't be like Ahab, because when we do that, we lose. We become losers. So, uh, turn to, to Mark chapter 9, and while you turn there, I'm going to uh, give you the second point here. And point number two is refusing to follow God's words will render you powerless in the Christian life, right? So point number one was refuse to be a pushover when the world attacks. You know, being, being a pushover leads into my next point. It's going to leave you powerless, right? Because you're going to eventually get further and further and further away from God's word. And God's going to draw back and not hear your prayers and chastise you. And then what do you have left to work with? You're going to be powerless. And Ahab feels powerless here. ben Hadad's coming against him. Yeah, he says this cool, you know, one-liner here in verse 11. But he really feels powerless. It's not until God sends a prophet to him that tells him, hey, I'm going to help you, that he, get, that he you know, mans up and gets help. So refuse to follow, refusing to follow God's words will render you powerless in the Christian life. And they took that from verse 4, which says, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. You see, he's not, only, he's not only just allowing himself to be a pushover, but he is powerless. He just feels absolutely powerless here. So you're in Mark chapter 9, look at verse 17, because we're going to look at the, a similar situation where the disciples felt powerless, right? So maybe you're here this morning, you feel powerless. Maybe the world's at is coming at you, you know, you're just down in the dumps, you just don't know what to do. Well, we can learn some, uh, some remedies here. Look at uh, verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So, you know, why couldn't they do it? Because they've been doing it prior to this. They've had God's power. They've been out there doing the works. But they, in this moment, I'll bet you anything, they felt absolutely powerless. They probably had that same feeling that Ahab had. Look at verse 19. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, wallowed and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So just real quick, I just want to give you a few quick tips here. If you feel powerless in the Christian life, if you feel like you're just being defeated, you're just getting... You know, you're just getting uh, bullied around. And, and number one comes from verse 19, and that is faith. What is faith? Faith is the evidence or the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You have to have faith. Because look, look at verse 19. It says, he answereth, answereth him and saith, O faithless generation. So they bring this guy into him, and he's like, look. Jesus is just like, look, you faithless people. You just don't have any faith. That's what's wrong. So when we lack faith, when we are unstable, when we don't believe that God's going to help us, you know what? You're opening yourself up to get bullied by the world. And number two is to believe. 
Look at verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Look, I don't know what you're going through here this morning or what you're going to go through, although I, whatever it is, it can be brought, you know, it can be turned around. It can be brought to good. God can turn that situation around for you because he says here in verse 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe. So when we come to God, we need to come to him believing that he's going to help us out with our trials and our tribulations. You might be sitting here this morning saying, well, I don't have anything really going on right now. You know, I'm doing pretty good and that's great. Amen. Praise God. But guess what? The day is coming where you will have trouble. You will have something come against you. Number three is avoid being double-minded. In James chapter 1, verse 8, it says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unstable. When we come to God and we're just like, Man, I don't really think God's going to help me because of this or because I you know, I, I got really mad in, in the traffic yesterday. You know, Look, you just, just letting yourself get like that, just being unstable, it, it, is not good. And God is not going to respect it. He's not going to hear that prayer. And it's just going to keep you in your current situation. And number four is continuous training. In verse 28, he says, and when he was come into the house, the, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? So they don't want to say it while everybody's around. They're just like, okay, what did we do wrong here? What's, what, what's going on? What, what, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said, you know, in verse 29, look, look at verse 29. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. See, they didn't know that. They had no clue. So we need to know the Bible. We need to hear preaching. We need to meditate on these things because knowledge is power. Understanding and, and growing in the, in the grace and knowledge of the truth is what's going to help us get past our trials and tribulations, get past that powerless feeling that we may get from time to time. So point number three, go back to, go back to 1 Kings chapter 20. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 20. Point number three is refusing to receive the whole counsel of God will ruin your life. Refusing to receive the whole counsel of God will ruin your life. So look at verse 13. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 13 says, And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young man of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. So now Ahab's on board with God's plan. He's like, Okay, this sounds good. You know, who's going to order the battle? Oh, that's what God said. Oh, I believe that. I believe that. No problem. See, look down at verse, skip, uh, skip to verse 38. We'll start there. Verse 38. It says, so the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And the king passed by. He cried unto the king and said, Thy servant went out into the midst of battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. Verse 40, And thy servant was busy here and there and was gone, and the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself has decided. So he's like, I don't care, that's your problem. Look at verse 41. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. So what do you see here? You see in the beginning of the chapter, he's all about it, right? In verse 13 and 14, when the prophet comes to Ahab, he's like, okay, that sounds great. I'm, I'm all about that. I will definitely follow that. You know, God's going to rescue us. Great. And he ignores like half of what the prophet tells him. He doesn't kill ben -Adad. In fact, he's like, oh, you're my brother. And we're we're going to look at this again here in a little while, in a little more detail. But refusing to follow the whole counsel of God isn't good for anybody. Yeah, it'll grow church number one that have thousands and hundreds of thousands well not hundreds of thousands but you know thousands of people in them you know because they only preach what's right but none are they going to win the christian life are they going to are, are they even saved for that matter you know so what i'm trying to say here is that when we refuse to just pick you know the whole bible and listen to it even the hard stuff we're really setting ourselves up for failure mark chapter 4 verse 4 says but he answered and said it is written by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of god you know 
You want to do big things for God? You want to get right? You want to have that zeal? Learn to, to love the Bible. Learn to that, that you're just make up your mind that you're going to live according to every word of God. You know, even what smites you in the face, all of it, it's all good. And of course, Jesus is quoting uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk. And so what do we learn from that is that if we want to follow the whole counsel of God, we need to desire that milk. We need to desire these words and read them every single day. Psalm 119, verse 140 says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. So the key to developing that love for the Bible is just understanding that God's words are pure. This isn't like any other book in the world. These words are pure. These words are what's going to deliver you out of your trials, out of your troubles, out of your tribulations. So point number four is recognize that unholy alliances will never cease to knock on your door. Right? They will never cease. So look at verse 31. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 31 says, And his servant said unto him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure he will save thy life. So these guys just get beaten down. You know, Ahab's obviously refusing to kill Ben-Hadad. They're not even going to try to wipe him out. But they're developing a plan already to stay in the picture. They're already developing a plan to say, well, maybe we can, you know, get... I threw out this garbage TV in my life, or I threw out this sin, I threw out that sin. I guarantee you, some devil is going to come, well, okay, you threw out the cable, you got rid of cable, you're not watching this, but... What about the YouTube when no one's looking? What about the Facebook video when no one's looking? You see what I'm saying? There's always going to be some back door they try to come in. Look at verse 32. So they girded sackcloth on their loins, and he put ropes on their heads, and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant ben Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. You see, this is why Ahab is a loser. He gets a victory. You know, God helps him out, and then he's like, okay, well, that's I'm happy now. I'm going to keep my wealth. I'm going to keep my family. I'm going to keep my goods. But now I can be friends with ben Hadad because he's cool. Look, the world isn't cool. The world, the Bible says that the wisdom of God, or the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. You're not going to get any kind of benefit by hanging out with the world, by hanging out with worldly people and taking part in their stupid conversations at work or at school or where, what have you. It's never good. They, you know, that, and that's exactly what's going on here. Ahab's like, he is my brother. Look, the world is not your brother. It is not your friend. It's, it's, it's just going to set you up for failure. Look at verse 33. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, thy brother Ben-Hadad. So right, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's your brother. Go ye bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him. And he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. So if you read this the same story in Chronicles, and you're reading this time period about the kings, you're going to run into uh, a man named Jehoshaphat, a king named Jehoshaphat. He had the same problem as Ahab. He liked to hang out with the, the wicked kings. And there's a, uh, a captain at this time named Jehu who winds up later becoming uh, king of Israel. A pal around with Ahab. And he says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? And obviously the answer is no. You know, should we help the ungodly by partaking in their crap, their garbage, their sinful, wicked things? And the answer is no. You know, the people that hate the Lord, like like the music industry, Hollywood, I don't want any part in that. That is what's going to keep you powerless in the Christian life if you don't let go of that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, look at what happened to Ahab here. Eventually, it's going to take over your mind, and you're going to say, he is my brother, you know? And that is the wrong attitude. The world is not our brother. That is not something that we want. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6 of Daniel, but keep your place in Kings, because we will come back to it. So Ephesians chapter 6, what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, recognizing that these unholy alliances, they're never going to cease to knock on your door, right? When you put one thing away, get ready because something else is going to come along. Something else that's tempting is going to come knocking on your door. Hey, I saw that you threw out cable. Uh, you ever thought about getting satellite? 
Hey, I saw that you threw uh, your TV out. You ever thought about getting the newest smartphone so you could watch all your stuff in private? You know, there's always some kind of stupid little, you know, uh, oh, trick that they're going to have. And that's exactly what the Syrians are doing to the, to the Israelites here. They're like, your stuff now, but can we still have part in your life? Can't we still hang around? So you're in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 12. I know you're probably familiar with this, but let's read it anyways. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities. So let's stop right there. You know, it's, it's not necessarily just us and our personalities that we're fighting against. He says we're fighting against principalities, against of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we have to, you have to understand this isn't a game. There is a dark thing that's going on here that we can't see. You see, you give something up, there's a devil somewhere looking at your life saying, how can I get in? How can I get back in? Now go to Daniel chapter 10, because we just read, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So when you decide to partake in the world's activities, you know, sinful things that Christians should not be a part of, you need to understand that that is a principality. There is a power of darkness that is behind that, that is trying to come into your life, that is trying to get you like Ben had had. So turn to Daniel chapter 10. And let's take an ex let's take a look at an example of what this looks like in the, you know in, in, the, in the spirit world, the world that we can't see. Because he says we wrestle we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? So there's this battle that's taking place that you and I we can't physically see. We can read about it, but we can't physically see it. So you're there in Daniel chapter ten. Let's see. Uh, go to look, look up at verse seven. We're going to read quite a few of these verses, but but I think you'll you'll enjoy it. Look at verse seven. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in, uh, turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. So right here we're picking up the story where Daniel's seeing a vision, and it's taken all his strength. It, you know, it's just, just, just too much. You just can't handle it. Look at verse 10. And, I, and behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And that's how we should have, that's the exact attitude we should have when we are reading the Bible, when we're meditating on God's word. So look at verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst send thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So here we have an example of Daniel wanting to know something and sending prayers unto God. And the answer doesn't come immediately. You know, you're may, you may be wrestling with God, and it's just, not, you, it's just not getting answered right away. And it's because of this battle that's taking place. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers of, the powers of darkness. So he's saying, hey, thy words were heard right away. But look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to take thee, I'm, I'm sorry, now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So if you look at verse 13, he says, but, this is the angel talking, he says, but, the prince, and that prince there is obviously the devil that, that hangs around with the king of Persia. A prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days below Michael. One of the chief princes came to help me. So sometimes there's this spiritual battle that we can't see that's taking place. And we have to understand that, right? You have to understand that there is a battle that we can't see that's very great, that is very, very powerful. And sometimes that's why we don't get the answers to our prayers right away. Not every time, right? But sometimes. But anyways, that or six, it should give you a very clear understanding of what's really going on out there. When you go soul winning, we're 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 in that battle, right? Just because we can't physically see it doesn't matter. It's still taking place, and I'm sure you've seen it. I mean, how many times have you gone and given the gospel to somebody, and you get like maybe real close to the prayer, and all of a sudden this dog just comes out of nowhere? Oh, here's Captain Pitbull. He just shows up out of nowhere. It's not even the dude's dog. You know, all of a sudden, someone's baby, you know, just starts crying. I'm not against crying babies, you know. 
praise God for that. But it's just like always, there's always, a lot, oh, the phone rings, always some kind of distraction. You know, I believe that that's that spiritual battle that we can't see. You know, devils are like, wait a minute, this guy's actually starting to believe this. We better do something. Where's the nearest dog? You know, where's the nearest queer that can come up and disrupt the, this conversation? I actually had that one time. I was soul winning in Vancouver, and this lady was really getting it. She thought she was saved. This was one of those tough cases. And I was like, finally, I'm getting through somebody who thought they were saved and, and, and weren't. And, um, and she's like, you know, my church just lied to me then, huh? You're telling me my church is lying to me. I'm like, well, yeah. They told you you had to repent of your sins to be saved. They lied to you. And she's like, wow. And no joke, these two sodomites come up and they're like, whose minivan is that over there? And guess what? It was mine. I was parked in, in, in the wrong spot. I don't know if this is much of the spiritual battle, but why'd they have to come up right when she was about to get saved, you know? And and she's like, she goes, she goes, you know what? Why don't you just get out of here because I'm about to get saved. That's literally what she said. And they were like, fine, you know. So thank God that she was, you know, really into it and really wanted to get saved. You know, she started mocking them and sent them off. And she's like, those people always complain about everything. And I wanted to get into to why, but I, I was like, no, you know, you need to get saved. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that was that was funny. But you know, it, it, there's always something like that. It, it it seems, you know, the look, these people are, are aren't just gonna stand by and let us do, you know, God's work. There's gonna be some resistance. There's going to be some resistance in our own lives. So, so point number four was recognize that unholy alliances will never cease to knock on your door. They're always going to be coming for you. They're always going to have something for us. Now, go back to 1 Kings chapter 20. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 20. Because there's this interesting story. You know, you're reading about uh, Ahab, how he's a pushover, how he feels powerless. And then Ben Hadad's like, "Oh, you want to challenge me? You want to you want to say stuff like this to me? Fine, I'm going to come, you know, and destroy you." And then there's a war, right? There, Ahab defeats the Syrians, and then the prophet comes back to Ahab and he says, "Hey, they're they're going to come back after winter. And they're going to come try again." So Ahab gets ready. When winter's over, they fight again. Ahab destroys them twice. You read the chapter; he destroys them twice. And then you have this little this little pause. It seems like a little pause in the story. In verse 35, where this prophet's like, hey, smite me in the face. You know, he's going around, hey, punch me in the face. Could you imagine seeing that? Somebody walking, you know, out here, you're out soul winning. This guy comes up to you, hey, punch me in the face. Give me an elbow, you know, or give me a, give me a front <laughs> kick to the chin. You'd be like, what are you talking about? And so I want to be sure and, and cover this in detail. So 1 Kings chapter 20, look at verse 35. And we'll, we'll read the story again. 1 Kings 20, verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, smite me, I pray thee, and the man refused to smite him, right? So understand that he's doing this in the word of the Lord. This is something that God has ordained, that God has commanded. Now look at verse 36. Then not obeyed the voice of the Lord. Behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. So we're going we're gonna to come back to that. Look at verse 37. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in smiting him, he wounded him. So this guy's like, I don't know if he heard about the first guy, but he's like, all right, you want me to hit you? I'm going to hit you hard. You know, so he gives him that street fighter technique. What is it, the sure you can, you know, <laughs> or, or we, we don't really know. I don't know if he maybe palm strike him, elbow. You know, the Baptist bouncers back here, they probably have a, a pretty good idea what this guy did, you know? You could brainstorm later on what kind of what kind of hit it was, but one thing we know is that it wounded the guy. You know, I mean, this guy's like, you want me to hit you? No questions asked. I'm all in. We're going to go ahead and hit you <laughs> and hurt you. So look at verse 38. It says, so the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. So I don't know if you've ever heard this preached before, but... I mean, this does seem like an unusual request, and it is. It's definitely, uh, you know, unusual. And, and at, at first glance, this is obviously a picture of the Word of God, right? This is a picture of Jesus Christ. Um, because in Isaiah 53, verse 4, for example, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, right? So when we get saved, you know, we're partaking in that smiting. We're partaking in what he did on the cross for us. You know, so that could be looked at as an exa as a picture of Jesus Christ, where the first guy that wouldn't smite him is like the guy who says, you know, I'm good. You know, are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? He's like, no, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, guys. I, 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 re I refuse to, to, to partake. I refuse Jesus Christ. I don't want to be saved. And then verse Isaiah 53, 5, it says, but he was wounded for our trans transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. 
with his stripes we are healed so like i said that's how this can be looked at as a picture of jesus christ and obviously the the guy in verse 37 that's like yeah i'm gonna hit you is the guy that's just all in okay i don't know if i'm saved i don't know if i'm going to heaven please tell me you know and he just just go ahead and he, and he partakes in it and gets saved but there's another thing going on here there's another picture here so the prophet could also be a picture of us who are already saved who are seeking truth right i mean how many of us here have the testimony of going to a church trying to find the truth just wanting a pastor, just wanting someone to just tell us what the Bible says, just preach it like it should be, hard preaching, and then you get to a church, you know, they, they maybe they read Romans 1, and they gloss over things, or they, they read verses out of being preserved, being inspired, being perfect, and they don't want to take that strong, hardcore stance on the King James Bible. They want to dance around the issues, right? But they want to bring, like, some missionary into their church that preaches repent of your sins, and they're like, yeah, well, we don't really believe that, but, you know, he's just young. He's just graduated from West Coast, so, you know, we'll give him some grace. No, we don't want that. You know, out. It, I mean, especially if you want to argue about it. Now, you know, people are obviously welcome here that, that have different views and stuff. We want to see people saved. We want to educate people. But if you don't want to believe, especially salvation, you want to preach work salvation, and you don't want to budge on that, you're gone. You're done. You know, we're not going to put up with that kind of garbage. And so... Um, look at verse 35 again. It says, And a certain man of the sons of the prophet said unto him, and refused to smite him. This is a picture of churches today, pastors today, people today that refuse to tell it like it is, that refuse the harder things in the Bible, that will not preach the truth of God to you. So look at the result there. And, and, and then, uh, what is it, verse 36, you know? That printer kind of fell me here. Then he said unto him, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall be referred to in the Bible also as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So you can rest assured that all these liberal churches out there, even the ones that are saved, you know, I'm not trying to wish any harm on them, but I do want you to understand that Jesus Christ is not playing games. Read, he will take away their candle. These churches that have the truth but are soft on God, you watch, they're going to fail. The only way to succeed with that kind of model is to go full-blown heretic. Go full-blown heretic and just reject everything. Just turn your back on all the counsel of God. That's the only way you're going to have that worldly success. That's how you're going to grow the numbers. But to them that are saved out here in this community, that have churches that are soft, guess what? A lion is going to come find them and destroy them. If you watch this thing in a couple months, it's going to take the doors. We are going to do the great works for God. We're going to have the zeal. And you know what? They can either get on board or get the hell out of here. If the choice is very clear. It's very simple. And so the first thing that you see here when you read about this, this story is that you have a choice, right? We have a choice. We have preachers that will smite you with the truth, and there's preachers that won't. And you know, Ahab refused hard preaching. So you're there in 1 Kings 22. Let me just, just show you this here. Go to chapter 22. Just a few pages to the right. 1 Kings 22. Ahab was a person that refused hard preaching. 1 Kings 22 here. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, 1 Kings 22, look at verse number 7. 1 Kings 22, verse 7. It says, And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? So I, I mentioned this earlier, that Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, liked to pass um, Ahab wants to go take back Ramoth Gilead from the Syrians. And Jehoshaphat's like, okay, I'm going to help you. You know, my people are as I people. And then verse 7 here, he says, okay, now that we've agreed to do this, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Because Ahab just brought out all his favorites, and they were telling him what he wanted to hear. So look at verse 8. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But, no, don't miss this, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. So, so Ahab here, we can see, is a king, is a person that hated hard preaching. He didn't want the like that. you got to be willing to have your toes stepped on. It happens to all of us, you know. I get my toes stepped on all the time. I've already, you know, I get my toes stepped on here, <coughs> everywhere. You know, it, it's just going to happen. Don't take that, that stance that Ahab has, because that's a recipe for disaster. So the first thing we, we learned out of our, our story here with the prophet is that we have a choice, right? You have a choice whether you go to the church that's just going to tell you the truth like it is, or, I mean, there's, what, four or five hundred other churches in the city you could go to, you know? Take your pick. But if you choose the other end, just realize, you know, just realize you're, you're going to be powerless. You're going to become a pushover. You're going to become weak. 
you are going to have problems, you're going to fail at the Christian life. And the second thing we see here is a challenge, right? So, I mean, think about this. After, you know, the prophet's going around, he asks this first guy, hey, hit me. You know, punch me in the face, elbow me, whatever. And, uh, and, and he won't. It didn't benefit him one single bit. In fact, you see, if you go to a liberal church, they won't teach you the truth. They're causing more work for you. Because now you got to go home, you gotta, you got to read. Well, you should read anyways, but right now you got to put on Pastor Anderson or, you know, Pastor Menace, something like that to get fed, right? That's a horrible, not horrible, but it's just not ideal. You know, it's just more work for you. It's more time. I'd rather just be able to come to a church like this where I can just get the hard preaching that I need. You know, a church like ours, you know, it doesn't have to be this one. You know, just, just pick a church that's going to teach you the truth, the whole counsel of God. And then that frees up more time, you know. And then you listen, listen to all the sermons you can, obviously, you know, read as much as you can, meditate and things like that. But the second thing we see ourselves is somebody that will not smite us, that won't tell us the truth. It's just going to cause you more work. It's going to cause problems. It's going to cause you to have to go actually move out there and find it. And the third, the third thing that we see here is a charge to go forward, right? I mean, after, after this prophet gets smitten, after he gets wounded, he just moves on. He's like, okay, I'm good now. I'm going to carry on with the mission. So look at verse 38. So the prophet, he gets hit. He's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> you know, have a, that, was a, that was a good shot. Have a good day. I got, I got a mission to go on, you know? And like I said, that's the attitude we need to have. When you're something you don't like, okay, fine, you got me. You hurt me with the truth. You know what? Monday morning comes rolling around. I'm just going to keep on going. I'm going to keep doing what's right, keep doing what God wants for me. So look at verse 38. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. You know, it probably goes well with the disguise. So here the prophet, he's like, okay, I'm going to go wait for the king. He covers his face with, uh, with ash, and he's probably wounded. So I'm sure that that goes, you know, it, it goes along well to, to, for the disguise. Because look at verse 39. He says, and as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and said, thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. So here's that prophet, right? He's waiting for Ahab, and he's like, I'm, you know, I, I, I got a mission. I've got to tell you a story here. And the king doesn't recognize him at first. So he says, Thy servant went out into the midst of battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt. There he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hast decided. So Ahab's like, Look, you made your bed lie in it. You know, I don't care. And he probably wouldn't have talked to the prophet like that if he knew it was him. So you see when people ask, well, why is this, why is this, this, this crazy story here in the Bible? To get hit for a sign for one thing, right? And it went well with the story because he said, hey, I was a man that went out to battle. So Ahab looks at this prophet. He probably sees him wounded, you know, covered in ash. He's like, yeah, he's been out to battle. Okay. You know, and then his heart is revealed because look at what he says. Like, so, you know, you decided it. You decided to lose the guy. So it's your fault. You know, now you're going to die. 41. And he hasted and took away the ashes from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was one of the prophets. You see, and that's how it goes for us sometimes, you know. Sometimes we're in Ahab's position where we're backslidden. We come to church, you hear something that smites you real hard, and then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, that came on quick. That came on real quick. He's preaching about me when, in fact, you know, maybe the preacher isn't. You know, he, he isn't it's for a reason, you know, so... Look at verse 42. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast not let go out of thy hand a man whom I have appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. So go back to 1 Kings chapter 22. We're almost done. 1 Kings 22. Really was a loser, right? I mean... Everything we've read so far just points in the direction of the loser, right? He lost out on God's full counsel. He could have done something right for God here, you know. He could have listened and killed Ben-Hadad and maybe just said, you know what, I'm going to get right with God. And actually, if you read chapter 21, he does humble himself before God. I do think Ahab was saved. I might be wrong about that. I personally think Ahab was saved. I think he got saved. I don't have time to get into it right now. Read the, read the next chapter when you get home. But uh, I, I do think that... <clears throat> You know, but he really was a loser. You know, he lost any chance. Think about this. You're going to spend more time in eternity, obviously, than you will here. So is it really worth sacrificing, you know, your eternal rewards just for temporary pleasure? And the answer is no. So 1 Kings 22, look at verse 34. 1 Kings 22, verse 34. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture 
and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. So this is Ahab here. He gets shot. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thy hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians, and he died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. Just like God said it would. Look at verse 36. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. Now look at verse 37. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. So if you remember, in 1 Kings chapter 20, after the prophet took the ashes away from his face, what, you know, what, did, king, what did we read about King Ahab? What happened? It says... We'll just, just turn back there. Look at, look at 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 40. 1 Kings 20, verse 43. It says, And the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. So you see here in, in chapter 20, Ahab goes back to Samaria. He's heavy and displeased. Chapter 22, verse 37, he goes back to Samaria, heavy with an arrow in his chest, sticking out his heart, and dead. Right? So what can we learn from that? Other people's mistakes. If we choose not to learn from our own mistakes, if we choose not to follow the words of God, Ahab's fate will become your fate. Ahab's fate would become my fate. Ahab's fate would become ours. So the title of the sermon is Hard Lessons Learned from a Couple of Losers. And the sermon can really be summed up into one sentence. Learn from your mistakes and learn from God's words, and you won't end up a loser like Ahab's. You to preach. Uh, thank you for this church. I pray you bless the fellowship and the soul winning, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you just please take care of us in Jesus.